Good evening. I've decided to put this King Arthur video together a little bit differently, a little bit better, in a way that I could wrap my head around it a little better, and hopefully maybe you can too, because it's all new to me. There might be some questions that some of you have. First video I did on King Arthur in America, I thought I just made it too busy. And the second one is more scholarly for those of you who like the textbook stuff. I wanted to make the one that was just right in the middle with the right amount of visuals, still shows the textbook stuff in the important places, and also gives a good synopsis of exactly what it is that Ramon is talking about. Well, there are two gentlemen who live in Wales. Their names are Wilson and Black. A very good documentary researcher that lives in Wales named Richard Hall has probably 10 or 15 hours of programs on Wilson and Blackett, and it covers the whole King Arthur saga. Apparently, King Arthur was indeed real, and actually there was two of them. Now, Ramon claims there was four, but two of them were somewhat insignificant, I think. But the first King Arthur, according to Ellen Wilson, and he is a very meticulous researcher in his late 80s right now, I think, and he's just as uh, just as energetic as ever. Uh, the first King Arthur, it looks like he lived in the 400s. That would be the 5th century. He had a son named Theodorus, who had a son named Theodore, who had a son named Thefault, who had a son named Tudrig, who had a son named Mirig. He had five sons. He had a son named Arthur Yurtler Pendragon. I always wondered where that name came from. And he was indeed married to a Gwynfar, Guinevere, right. Guinevere, I got it. Um, just to set the record straight, there are a lot of myths about King Arthur, but King Arthur was indeed a real king. In fact, there were two of them, and that's something that I just recently learned. But there is the genealogy. For more in-depth details on all of that, I will leave a link to a playlist of all of Richard Hall's King Arthur videos. You can check that out at your convenience. I just wanted to give a little bit of a pre-story here, and I wanted to show this again in a little bit better of a light, I think. So I hope you enjoy the show. This is some of our real history. And please, I ask if you um, don't agree with it, to at least watch it and give it a fair chance. And f okay, okay, okay. <laughs> King Arthur in America The stories of King Arthur and his knights have long fascinated readers, young and old alike. Some of America's most prominent writers and artists, from Mark Twain to Howard Pyle to F. Scott Fitzgerald to John Steinbeck, have treated the legends in their work. The influence of the legends extends well beyond into literature and American popular culture. From the early 20th century, youth group, the Knights of King Arthur, which became a model for Sir Baden Powell's Boy Scout movement, to advertise, architecture, food, products, toys, games, graphic novels, comic books, popular music, and of course, television and the movies. Beginning with early silent films, like Thomas Edison's Knights of the Square Table, or The Grail, 1917, over the years, in fact, the Arthurian legends have influenced some of America's most iconic figures, from Frank Lloyd Wright and Charles Lindbergh to John F. Kennedy and even Elvis Presley. Most people know that already, but here's something that most people do not know. In AD 562, Britain was struck by a comet, or the planet Mars maybe. This great catastrophe that devastated and destroyed most of the Great Island, the majority of the large population between 9 and 10 million were annihilated, 
The lands were contaminated and diseased, and it was death to enter these great wastelands for around 7 to 11 years. This gigantic disaster is one of the major events in British history. It is probably the cause of the Roman Church insisting that no stone could ever fall from heaven onto planet Earth, until the Church was compelled to admit the truth when a large shower of meteorites landed near the French village in AD 1803. And Velikovsky covered that in Worlds in Collision. I remember reading it. Two things then happened as the Anglo, Saxon, and Jute people swarmed into empty and largely depopulated lands where the survivors were struggling to restore their devastated and destroyed country. This was to become ludicrously known as the Anglo-Saxon Conquest. The second disaster was the arrival in coastal eastern Britain of Austin in AD 597, sent from Rome to preach Catholicism to the immigrant pagan Angles and Saxons. I'm wondering where they would get a name like Angles and where they would get a name of Saxons. Often wondered that. Rome was seizing the opportunity to get into apostolic Christian Britain. The religious wars that went on for centuries were about to commence. The word religious war, I don't know, it's kind of an oxymoron. In the confusions of destruction and widespread disease resulting from these common impacts. King Arthur II had evacuated the army to Brittany. Brittany and Normandy were British territories until AD 952. He returned to Britain as the diseases abated. His brother had sailed west in search of new lands. In his history of the Franks, then living Gregory of Tours, a contemporary writer, records that the two islands in the sea. Britain and Ireland were on fire from end to end at a date which is easily fixed at 562 AD. This would be the disaster resulting from the comet debris striking large areas of Britain and Ireland. King Arthur and his voyage to America and his burial. Madoc Morfarn, the Cormorant, some of these words are really hard to pronounce for me, a brother of Arthur II had sailed west in search of new lands, which might be a place where people could live. In AD 572, Madoc returned after 10 years, that's a long time, and detailed the discovery of America. In AD 573, Admiral Gwynnon sailed to confirm Maddox's star reckonings, and in 575, Arthur II, Maddox, and M. Wynn Du sailed in a 700-ship fleet for America. All this is absolutely provable and again bad news for Rome. The Guarchin Mildrew and other records place the Prince Maddox being at sea for 10 years. And so from 562 to 572, there is an array of physical evidence and inscriptions in the Colburn alphabet on the East Coast and Midwest of North America. Malguin was then elected in AD 580. In AD 574, Arthur is said by Tellison to have been ear ear towards that which is beyond. America for four years. This brings us to 578 when he was assassinated. There's not very much on that. I wish it, there would be more, but there isn't. Then this body was kept under an overhang for the winter and brought back to Britain in the spring of to summer of 579 for burial. This is clearly the best recorded funeral in British ancient history, which is why Arthur II is claimed to be untraceable. Melwag was then elected in AD 580. Everything fits into place from data in these records. So there were two powerful kings named Arthur, and to avoid the enmity and wrath of London and Rome, these were welded together into one great king, burial of Arthur II. And that's what we're going to hear. So I hope you enjoy the show. I just wanted to fill you in on the history there. David Icke wrote that. Shifu Ramon will regale us with how this all came about. I'm all ears and I'm, I can't wait to hear. So, without further ado, here's Ramon. Looking at the rooms that are on the rocks. So they weren't looking at it from a plasma uh, script sort of uh, perspective. They were looking at it from a diffusion perspective, you know, coming out, coming out of uh, England, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Wales. And they had good reason for that because the runes here are translatable and there is a culture called the Ford ancient that they do not uh, they do not understand 
exactly why these people changed from the Hopewell into the Fort Ancient Culture. And the although they use conical mounds, there is a difference in the behaviors of the Fort Ancient Culture versus the Hopewell. And it's very mysterious. And they're also a very defined area starting at the Falls of the Ohio and coming over um, into the central of Kentucky and up into the uh, southern Ohio. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is really important and we're going to come back to it. Okay. Now, as I, as I was working with them, I started to learn more and more about the work of Wilson and Blackett. Okay. And uh, Wilson and Blackett, they are kind of, in my mind, amateur legends. They, they went forward and, and did Arthur research using the Welsh stones and came to amazing uh, conclusions and then even found the headstone of King Arthur. And they published a book on it. They just followed it all like the, the bread comes, you know? So they would just follow the trail and they would come to the conclusions that they would come to. I'm going to change to um, not speakerphone because my family's making a lot of noise. I don't hear anything, but okay. Well, I know, but it's it's there. Okay, you, yeah. so <clears throat> along somewhere in there, I started to learn about the Electric Universe stuff, and I started making my own discoveries. Some things started to overlap. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah. and so as I'm reading uh, Wilson and Blanket, uh, I start thinking about what they're really doing in terms of the Cosmic Hill and the Saturnian myth. Mm -hmm. And now now comes to the thing that really threw me, I, which I did not know, that Camelot was a bastardization or, you know, a, a, a kind of a derivative through the French of the original uh, words in uh, Kumaric, Kair Melon, where Kair is a hill fort, and Melon means yellow-brown, kind of a yellow-brown, exactly like the color of Saturn. Mm. Yes. Now, I started to think about the potential of looking at the entirety of the Arthurian tradition, which is derived out of Troy. The whole reason they were called Brits is because of Brutus of Troy. Mm. This entire tradition may have been a very ancient um, Saturnian tradition that was displaced due to cataclysms and such, and that fled up that way, later on becoming Christian, of course. By the time of Arthur, and uh, but early Christian, right? Not not anything like we would recognize, but but uh, definitely Christian nonetheless. And that this uh, culture had ancient throwbacks to the uh, Saturnian myths, uh, the Talbot Talbot type myths, right? So this paper that I wrote was, is all about that. And I'm relying upon the works of uh, Wilson and Blackett mm -hmm. because they took the time to get access. Now, a lot of people out there are going to, to have doubts about the Arthur tradition. I want to say, first of all, that whole saying, where there's smoke, there's fire, is definitely something I believe when it comes to myths. That if there, you have... A myth, I am likely to believe that there is an origin for that, and I do not believe in, you know, like, for example, people will say Jesus is a pure, there was a school of people, and they're trying to convey this and that, and so they invented the perfect man. I, that kind of conspiracy theory, I think, has no uh, basis. There, It's pure conjecture. You know, in that part of the world, Arthur, the name Arthur is like, I don't know, it'd be equivalent to Caesar or even Moses, so I would be shocked if there never was a King Arthur, meaning it's synonymous with a great man. Likely, you start with a seed of something and it becomes something else. Mm -hmm. The Tao Te Ching was probably written by uh, a man who may have been Lao Er, we don't know, but he probably wrote the first two verses. We know he didn't write all 81. You can tell that because the writing style changes the penmanship style changes. We have an, now older copies of the Tao Te Ching, and we know for sure that it was modified uh, between the, the, the oldest copy that we now have and the, the copy that everyone was relying upon for thousands of years. But that doesn't change the fact that at some point there was probably a guy, Lao Tzu. And the same thing with Shakespeare, same thing with Homer. Um, I have no doubt that there were original people who were the source of these stories. 
Mm-hmm. And Arthur is no less the case. In fact, there's a lot of evidence for Arthur. Um, there's this entire thing that I, I didn't know about called the Land of Charter. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Land of Charters are the notes in the, located in the margins of the Bible at the Land of Church in Wales, which chronicle land exchanges and title exchanges and other things uh, that are political uh, and church-state related uh, between Arthur II's family and um, the church. So, for example, his, uh, his grandfather, uh, Tudric, who we would call Theoderic in English, mm-hmm. was uh, excommunicated at one point for killing his own brother. And for a few years was an excommunicated patron. Then was brought back into the church and uh, enabled to be uh, forgiven. And then, by the time he dies, becomes a saint. He does this by donating land for the church. Because at that time, the uh, kings controlled all the land. And the uh, church had to receive charters for their... Mm -hmm. Okay, so this was not the uh, typical way we look at the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Um, This was a much more um, contractual system. And so there was a lot of religious politics involved at that time between Arthur's family and the other. Now, there's more to the story in terms of uh, which Arthur, because there is a 300-year gap in the stories of Arthur conquering Romans and then even penetrating into Europe and, and beating the Romans on their own turf before coming back to, to Britain, and then the Arthur who we have in the land of charters. So as it turns out, there's two Arthurs here. Okay. One is Arth, Arth, uh, Arthweir, and one is Arthwis. Uh-huh. It's called the Arthur one and two. Now there's two other ones, but they're named after Arthur the second. Uh, and Arthur the first, because these were Arthurs that were, you know, let's see if we can create, you know, if you name the second one after the first and it turns out really well, then maybe the third one will, you know, be the, the next come. But it wasn't to be. I mean, long term, the immigration of Germanic peoples and uh, Nordic peoples um, to the region, to the, the island, and to particularly to England, Logris, uh, there's just too much coast for the kingdoms in Glamorgan and Gwent to control, but they controlled the best port, and so for a long time they were able to hold it. Now, how were they able to hold it? Unlike where Caesar encountered people who would give up fairly easily, they used these systems of hill forts. And these hill forts were arranged in rings, uh, which provided for mutual defense. And uh, so let's see what, what page we can see. We're going to skip ahead of that and then come back. Okay. Uh, boop, boop, boop. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so uh, page seven contains uh, uh, the Car- Carleon uh, fort system example. Okay. Now, the Roman site in the center there by the River Usk is what people claim is a, is a Arthurian age, but the problem is on flat ground, and it's in a square, and it's obviously Roman. Uh, the real Carleone is over to the west of that, okay. and it's up on a hill. All of these sites that you see here are all hills, and they arrange them in a ring. Okay, now, the thing that blew me away is that there is a couple of these rings which are in a hexagon shape. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. that's a convenient shape. That's a convenient strategic shape, but it is also a shape that's associated with Saturn. Uh, yes, now, it is. Going back to, the, to, to uh, Camelot itself, if you go back up to page two, okay. um, Justin Black had identified a large egg-shaped hill, and roughly egg-shaped, which is also near one of the only natural springs in all of Wales, uh, which is a sulfur spring. So now they have a yellow spring next to an egg-shaped hill, which has uh, references to this day, to the yellowness. And we uh, believe that there are ruins that uh, that were there and then also have been removed by archaeologists. Hmm. Uh, And they step through it in their books. So I definitely recommend people to get their books. 
um, if you have trouble, we can. I, I know the guy who has the uh, copyright currently. We can help you get the books. Uh, I obviously definitely recommend uh, if you can find a copy of Artorius Rex Discovered. Uh, also, the King Arthur Conspiracy is uh, another one. Okay. Uh, but they tend to be expensive books, but believe me, they're worth it. Um, and so using that, we actually went and scanned this hill and got a good – and it's a strategically uh, powerful place. This is where if you wanted to put Camelot anywhere, you would definitely put it up there. I learned from their work that, that the round table was not just a, a, a physical table, but it was a concept of all these kings come together. They weren't knights at all. They, they, were, they were kings, mm -hmm. and they all had their own hill forts in which they were kings over the lands around them. And they would come together, and they would elect a high king. Arthur II's family was descended from Arthur I, mm -hmm. who was descended from Brutus of Troy, right? So yeah. they had mo the most legitimate claim yeah. going back. So again, the concept, the archetype of the father begetting the son uh, comes again. I think most people are familiar with that, that concept from uh, our own, you know, heir, you know, believing in inheritance. Mm -hmm. But originally, that, that is coming from the exchange of energy, the plasma exchange going from uh, Saturn to Jupiter and then from Jupiter to, uh, I think, Mars. Uh, but at any rate, so uh, a lot of this paper, I, I, I talk about um, the real King Arthur uh, myths uh, versus uh, what have come down to our romantic beliefs. Uh, if you look on page four, there's a uh, table. Uh, and, we're, and then here's another correction. There were four Arthurs, not just three. I learned later there was a fourth one, but uh, you get the point. Mm -hmm. So you have Ar Arthfail and Arthwis and then Arthfail II. Uh, so these are the three, uh, three different King Arthurs. And then he had multiple Guinevere wives. Um, and you have, uh, you know, the just various things uh, about uh, Merlin and, um, you know, his battle with uh, uh, Mordred. All of that stuff, which is real, and uh, then 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 there's other things that are just completely made up, and they're part of the romantic. So we've been completely tricked in our culture into what we should believe, yep. and I can't underestimate the power of that uh, to control a culture's understanding. Now, the reason why this happened is after they the uh, Welsh were finally defeated by the English, they were still difficult to control because they had their own language. So in uh, the late Middle Ages, it was made illegal for them to uh, teach or write in Kumrik. And in fact, the teachers were removed and only English teachers were installed. The entire country was taken over by, uh, by the import of royal blood from England, from mm. Anglo-Saxon. Mm. So they weren't defeated. Uh, they weren't defeated militarily. They were defeated politically and with savvy, which is yeah. smart. Yeah. Because they had learned from the Romans a lot of uh, strategy uh, that was really quite brutal. I mean, one one example is they would surround the picks, and then they would build a wall around the picks, and they would they would make a fortress out of them, and then starve them to death, which is a yeah. really smart tech. Um, but you know, they were just really difficult to to uh, to attack. So instead, they were defeated with, with uh, political cunning and, and savvy. Ever since, Wales has always been part of the United Kingdom. Um, but they were not allowed for a long time to have uh, their own teachers and teaching that language. And so to this day, very few people, um, I mean, uh, not the majority of people in Wales will speak uh, the Kumarik. Uh, however, the names of the places and things there are, are still... Uh, they're strange. I mean, there's rom romanticized versions, ang anglicized versions of the names. Like I mentioned, Tudrig is uh, Theoderic, and uh, uh, Muerig, his son, is Maurice. And, of course, uh, as I mentioned, Arth Arthwis is Arthur. Uh, on page uh, five, you can see the names of these uh, British kings on the left in the Welsh stones. Okay, these are stones that are carved. They're often strewn about the countryside and left in carports at churches, just laying around for anyone to walk up and see in Wales. And then you can see that there are uh, analogs of Roman, uh, Roman names over on the right. And now a lot of people are going to, to say, well, these don't seem similar enough, but some of them are uncanny. 
And so what, you know, what if it's possible that uh, for a while the Roman Empire was controlled uh, there at Glamorgan and Gwent? It's possible. I'm not making that, that assertion, but they, they are, apparently. Um, the bottom line, though, is that I feel that there is a strong connection of the Saturn myth and the legitimacy of the original line of kings. And in fact, that this line of kings knew also about North America, which is going to come in handy later. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of looking at the, uh, on page 10, you can see on the cover, you can see the headstone that they found, which, by the way, is now in America. It's been shipped out of England because, again, I know the guy who purchased the copyright. Well, he also got the stone because the... Um, the government there would not declare that it was legitimate, and so it couldn't be called a historical artifact. In order for them to call it a historical artifact, they'd have to admit that it was legitimate. And so they wouldn't, so now it's been shipped, and it's in America. Mm-hmm. And uh, if people want to get involved in in uh, getting that stone displayed, uh, George is always looking for help, so please reach out to me. Okay. Um, now, the, you can see Camelot is put in that image in figure three in the center of many different forts and this is adjacent to the Carleone system so i think also that they would move about and reestablish these ring systems if that makes sense like that they would have different ages of you know a hill fort system but i i think that they probably started off with the hexagon in mind or other shapes like squares, the square and circle motif, um, the uh, asymmetric octagons, and then they would then they would move uh, along. Of course, they have to build you know using the hills that uh, are most important. Um, figure five on the next page. I'm just uh, talking about the cosmic uh, mountain, you know, and different cultures having different names. But it's one of the most ubiquitous. Every culture having a cosmic mountain, and uh, I want to point out that uh, in China, the, the king himself is associated with uh, with the color yellow. Right, and mm-hmm. this is a. Uh, more than one king associated himself with yellow. So mm-hmm. this is why we think that, that uh, Carmelon has to be in the center of the rings because it would be the safest place for the high king okay. in order to, to survive. And then he would have to, he would have to go and inspect all, all the different hill forts and, and kind of wander about. That would put him in danger. But in general, once the inspections are done, and everything is, is all the commerce is flowing correctly, you know, going to the center. Camelot would be, uh, truly be a shining hill, hill on a, on a fort on a hill. Mm-hmm. Now, it wouldn't be a big Norman style castle with big, big, thick walls. It would be a little bit more porous because A, the technology wasn't as, as high then as it is in the Dark Ages. Uh, and B, we'll, we'll talk about the, the Dark Ages uh, in a second, but. B, the uh, political system, when they would be invaded, they would pull all the people into the cities, and then they would themselves use, use horses and cavalry to defend the plains, so the fighting would be kept away from the hill as much as possible. Mm-hmm. So they didn't need big, big, big... Now, as for Dark Ages, I don't understand, and th- this I, I learned after you know studying from uh, Michael Crichton, I- ironically enough, the Dark Ages were not really dark in terms of, of um, you know, lamplight or something. They were dark because of the withdrawal of the Roman Empire. And so dark to us because we are the culture descendant of the uh, Anglo culture, which is descendant of the Roman culture, right? Sure. And so there were other empires that had occupied those regions in Europe, like the Gauls and the Visigoths, etc., and uh, they uh, made technological advancements because the, in, in, in the realm of war is, is, or milling and granaries and things, things like that. So they made progresses. It wasn't completely dark. And it was also scientifically dark, but you know, almost everywhere in the world was, really, if it makes sense. Mm-hmm. So the, 
the castles at in in Glamorgan and Gwent were not as advanced. And that's also why we don't find as much of them. You can still, though, go and find uh, these stone walls that go around these hill forts uh, up on the hills. When they haven't been destroyed and the neighborhood put up, mm -hmm. uh, you can find all that in, uh, information still around. Uh, the, the, the stones, some of these churches that are more than 1,000 years old, sometimes almost 2,000 years old. Um, and you can see where they had the church and then they m moved it over here because they were building with stones, but they weren't necessarily building like ancient Egypt here. I mean, some of this stuff, they, they, um, they, I mean, it's really quite, uh, uh how would you say primitive in it com compared to mm -hmm. the dark ages kind of forts that we're used to and the Roman stuff and the Norman stuff is what survives the ages. So the archaeologists look at it and go, well, this must be the real, you know, origin. So Arthur must have been a Roman soldier. That's all nonsense. <laughs> yeah. it's, in, it's in the actual Welsh stones, who he yeah. was, who his family is, and the whole, the whole tree is available. And Wilson and Blackett have, have, have uh, in the text, found all this information going back well, well beyond. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think if there's anything else in this paper that's absolutely necessary to talk about. Now I get into a lot of stuff that is, you know, just talking about Egypt and talking about uh, the cosmic eye. Mm -hmm. um, there, of course, are connections to uh, various father-son gods. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, on, on page, it looks like 23... I give an example of a, a situation where I, I have a map I created of the um, Arthurian, uh, I guess, the hill forts there in Wales. And I had predicted that if this was a hexagon system, there should be a fort in this circle. And guess what? It, I got a, someone gave me as a gift another one of their books. And there is exactly a fort right in, in that system that we can we could open up the map even and show people. Um, my map is uh, technically public. Uh, it's, of course, being a Google map, it has a very long hashtag. I don't have a short. Uh, for the Hidden Kentucky Project, I have a short, uh, you know, URL, but not, not, for the, not for the other map. I can get it to you, and you can yeah. share and yeah. we'll explore I the just Google map. Put it in the video. Uh, yeah, but I mean an actual dynamic Google Earth map that they're okay. actually able to scroll around themselves. We'll okay. get you the link and then you can put that in. Yes. I mean, it is a really, really uh, a lot of fun because it also has the the Welsh stuff that we found in America. Okay. Uh, so anyways, I, I was able to predict using the, the Saturn myth where I thought a hill fort should be. And then lo and behold, in another Wilson and Blackett book, um, there was a hill fort in that area. Mm -hmm. um, I call it a vague, a vague hexagon. Yeah. Uh, and, and I just want to point out that the, the authority here that we're talking about is not much different than the Chinese concept of the will of heaven. Um, and then, of course, you get into the floating uh, island and the towering castles in the sky and... Uh, all those kinds of ideas that 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 hearken to the Arthurian uh, mm -hmm. myth. I, I end this with conclusions question mark because after all, it, it is a lot of mystery. We don't know enough. There's not enough research in the Arthurian tradition uh, in terms of legitimate um, belief uh, in him as a real person. Uh, yeah. by academics. There is another work uh, by Dr. Robert McCann, and he uh, approaches it as a scholar should, as if he's a real person, and he goes through the, the myths, and of course he's, he's contemporary now, so he's able to get away with more. Uh, he is out of Oxford, and so he's able to look at it now. Now that the, the Walls are coming down because the internet 
because we're, you know, there's more freedom now in the West than there was 20, 30, 40 years ago uh, to talk about these things openly. And mm-hmm. now he, for him, he starts Arthur in the north of Wales, but still Wales, not England. Folks, there was no, there was no Winchester at the time, right? That's all lies that have been put out by uh, tourist agencies and, and uh, English propaganda, you know, because they needed to steal the they needed to steal the myth in order to keep it um, the power for themselves right. to rob the original people of their independence, right? Yes. These Celtic peoples that were that had a kingdom they had a kingdom in in Glamorgan and Wales but they owned they they considered themselves the masters of the whole island right mm-hmm. from the king from the first Arthur they had conquered the they they felt the whole thing and then Ireland and then Brittany uh, over in the north of France was was part of theirs it, they they controlled all those sea lanes and and, and they and they were fantastic sea uh, farers and uh, horsemen, okay. and, and then over time they granted lands to the Picts, and then the Anglo's and the Saxons arrived, and the Nordic peoples, and and sometimes they made war on them, and sometimes they let them go, and in the end that that did that did cost them because the Visigoths were able to pierce right up, and the Vandals right go on up go yep. on up the middle, and and cut the island in half, and, and you know eventually they could no longer consolidate their power anymore. The world moved beyond. The technology that they had, they they lived. They were like the Chinese. They stayed in this old belief system, and this old belief system goes back to the uh, the the reign of the above God. Okay, so now it's time for us to click on. I don't know if yours shows it, but mine shows related papers on the right. It says Uchel the High Lord. If yours doesn't say that, you can click the back and just go to my um, Uchel. Where is it at? Uh, uh, you could just get click back and then and then go find it. Okay. Um, All right. Um, uh, control if you control F U C H. F. I got to remember that. Mm. That's handy. And then type in what now? U C H E L. Yeah. And Shangdi. Yeah, Shangdi. Shangdi is the. It means the above God in the Chinese. All right, so now here's where things get really fascinating. There's an argument from the <clears throat> Victorian anthropologists and linguists that – not that Kumarik isn't real, but that Colburn, the script, is not real. That uh, Morgan Yolo invented this, this alphabet. Now, Morgan Yolo is a bard, and his tradition as a bard – is to go around and collect stories and embellish the stories and add to the stories and sing the stories and receive patronage for the singing of stories around the fire and in the halls and etc. That's his job, you know. It's not an academic job. It's a job of a man who's a bard. Now, he had to have something to base it from. So he had already a series of scripts, and then he added to those scripts which is uh, in order those runes. And the reason he did that was to improve the tradition. He was an excellent bard. He was uh, quite a character, uh, as all the, the, the great bards are. And uh, he did make up stories. But there are also things that were obviously real Welsh myths uh, that had come down from the ages. And... And just like Sequoia was, you know, claimed that he invented an entire alphabet, this is impossible. It's just not a thing that people – I mean, you and I can invent an, a, an alphabet. It doesn't mean anybody's going to use it, okay? Right. It, this is an alphabet that already existed. So I wanted to show that through the plasma script – so this is my, my theory when I set out to write this paper – that the Colbrin – like the Chinese scripts, which I had already, through a series of papers, uh, talking about Sumo, talking about uh, Shangdi and uh, Dao, uh, Shangdi, Heaven, and Dao, talking about uh, uh, later on a Tai Chi paper, talking about these things, that there is a connection between these ancient scripts and the Saturn myths, and that these are plasma scripts. 
But now here here's the logic. If if these scripts, just like Hebrew and possibly Egyptian, come from symbols in the sky, right? Then that establishes because we know the scripts in China in China are real, that the Colbrin is real too. You follow me? Yes. If there are scripts that show up in both, they, even though they're across the worlds from each other, and we are not maintaining that uh, the Welsh and the Shang of uh, China are related, then there is uh, a reasonable suspicion that Colbrin is a real runic system, which would make the Welsh language legitimate and all their stories legitimate, and then all of those archaeologists can go jump off a bridge, okay? Because yeah. they are lying to people, and right. they're and they're perpetuating a myth that is, um, you can't say racist, but it's definitely ethnist, right? It's right. it's an ethnocentric a lie that Arthur is not real, or that if he's real, he must have come out of uh, England, okay? Remember they were showing up, and then they look. If you look though. The, the, the Y is the upside down of the T and TH. Mm -hmm. and, hmm. and these are showing up in uh, the Ohio River Valley. You saw those when we covered the stones in the last parts. Yes. Okay. Amazing. All right. So, yeah, it's, it's yeah, really it's just quite amazing. Yeah, it blows my now, mind. On figure four on page six, we have an example of something that, that has been thrown under the bus by the mainstream archaeology of course uh, by people who didn't know anything about Welsh tradition uh, as a complete fabrication on the left is the uh, original and then uh, the the right is the the wax uh, replica of the grave Creek stone okay okay now they can't translate that with anything else but Colburn nothing else mm. this is found in America oh, okay yeah. Yeah, I, right, you so, know this uh, is all new to me, so uh, yeah, don't I worry about my lack of response. I'm just wowed. <laughs> well, so. On on uh, on <clears throat> page seven, you can see Wilson and Blackett step through, and then they start to actually uh, in the King Arthur conspiracy. They cover these different stones that are found in America that have no translation, according to archaeologists, because they're forgeries, they're fakes, they're hoaxes, elaborates, they never conformed at all to Ogham and and, uh, and Hebrew and all this stuff. Well, that's true, because they're not Ogham or Hebrew. They're Colburn. That X also shows up in the Chinese. Of course it, of course it does, because it's just an X. But the point is, uh, later on, we see that the Kros is also associated with wind. Okay. Hmm. But the main point here is that we're looking from the Grave Creek Stone at the uh, Uchel. All right. Hmm. So step <clears throat> uh, to figure six on the next page, you can see the etymology uh, of uh, mankind <clears throat> in Chinese. And uh, you can see that we are uh, getting different references to it looks like a thunderbolt. Yes. Right. But also, uh, there is the, over there on L31206, you can see the man who looks like he's bending over, and you can also see uh, the legs uh, of the, the god, and we start to see these plasma scripts. And, on, of course, in this paper, I don't spend a long time going over that stuff because I covered it all in another paper, uh, Shangdi Heaven and Dao. So if people okay. want to know about that, they should look at the Sumo paper and the Shangdi Heaven and Dao paper all about the Shangdi and the origins of those uh, symbols. I do mention them down below. Uh, on, they're on page eight, uh, Gao, Da, and Tai. Uh, tai is interesting because, uh, well, see, you can see Da has the great man with the one line above, uh, but then Tai, which uh, means the highest or greatest, uh, has a little penis. Now the yeah. penis, the, the little penis there, um, is also in the word uh, uh, de, as in Dao the Jing. And that de, when you look at the etymology for de, you find two spheres that are connected with some kind of uh, uh, like thing. And it does look like a scrotum. And if you recall, Zeus castrated uh, uh, 
uh, Zeus castrated Cronus, right? right? And he lost the two uh, testicles. Um, but it might have been that there was a plasma stream that was streaming between them, and then that was cut off and ended. Yes. Then, so there's all these uh, phallic references. All right, yeah. so you can see the etymology of uh, uh, big or da there in figure seven on the next page, and you can see most definitely that is our squatter man. Yeah, it is. Yeah. There you go. I That's mean, very, sure. J23197. Okay, so we're looking for um, the similarities here uh, with with the other. Now, if you scroll down on figure seven, uh, you can see also some of the um, origins for the above are clearly the boat motif with uh, something in the center. Yes. What is that something in the center? If you refer back to the last paper we were just looking at, uh, in in uh, Kentucky, we have a relief that is a hexagon shape with a raised uh, a central sphere. And it, we know it's, a, it's a, a partial sphere because when you look at a ball at a direction, you don't see half of the ball. You see like maybe the top one third. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's exactly how that relief is done. And so here, what I'm speculating is that that dot is Mars. And that the crescent is exactly as Dave Talbot has described. It is a is the glowing uh, coming from below, and it's it's able to rotate. Okay, and then that okay. symbol, the above God. So we know that the that the Shang here is describing uh, originally Saturn, uh, and then has come to signify the Lord. And you can also see some of these look like a person in prayer. Mm -hmm. So you have a some signifying a person who is a uh, subject to that Lord. Uh, yes, yes. When you go down to the next page, you have D, uh, and you have uh, symbols in D. You can see the uh, hex hexagonal aspect, but you can also see uh, some of the etymology for heaven, uh, which because D has uh, the Tien symbol in it, which means heaven. And, and so you have in Tien, you have the etymology. You can clearly see now we have the squatter man undergoing some kind of electrical phase change. Um, and possibly uh, references also to the Thunderbolt. It's not exactly uh, clear there. I think perhaps a Peratt instability. Yes. As it, as it was developing. Okay. Are you, are you following with me so far? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Looking at the Chinese. We're looking at the Chinese because it's A, legitimate. B, uh, we have a timetable that has been set. Of course, I think it's been too compressed, and that the, the old Chinese uh, reading of the dates is probably more correct. Uh, and... Um, and, but at least it can be dated. And, uh, and in some cases, it does correspond. You know, the end of the Shang seems to correspond with the Hopewell very well. Makes um, sense. Formation of the, uh, the Adina <clears throat> Hopewell Lake. Um, so, you know, whatever events inspired one culture may have inspired the other culture, being, that being the point. And the other thing is that the plasma scripts are in uh, excellent shape coming out of China. Uh, whereas over here, unless they carved it in rock, um, or in, in, again in uh, in the aisles, unless they carved it in rock, it, it's not likely to be found because uh, they wrote on perishable materials. Whereas the Shang were carving these things on turtle bones and uh, deer bones and things like that, right. right? They were carving it on shells and whatnot. So the, the they did burn them though, just like everybody. They burned these these plasma scripts because it was a, a purification. I was just watching about the story of India, Michael Wood, and they have a festival there. That's a 12-day festival in southern India to the the fire god, and then at the end they burn everything. Uh, and the, <laughs> the language of the uh, poem that they're singing for those 12 days is undecipherable. They don't know what it means. Mm. Uh, certain parts of it they know, but but a lot of it they don't know what it means uh, to this day. Mm. So which means back to a very far age. Okay, yeah. so. When, when we get into uh, here in uh, Kentucky on uh, page, well, let's let's go back actually. Let's go back up to. Uh, I had a, a map that showed the different coins. Yes, that was interesting. I saw that. I, I want to make a point about that. The archaeologists claim they do not claim that these coins are are forgeries because that would be impossible. What they claim is that they brought back by World War II veterans. But I want mm -hmm. you to look at something. Are they saying that only veterans who went to Europe 
came from the eastern part of the United States and that only veterans who, like, I guess, went to the Pacific or in the West Coast? Because I don't think that's how that works. No. Okay. Yeah, These I coins were found here because the Great River, that is the Ohio River, and, that, and merges in the Mississippi, that Great River was the greatest river in North America. Mm-hmm. And all these are sea lanes, uh, high, highways to economic values. And these, these uh, Roman coins have been found in the interior of Kentucky and then North Carolina and Tennessee and Georgia. This is not an accident. No, we didn't think so. Right? Right. This is, and this is not people dropping their who, – who brings back a Roman coin from Europe? And all these, all these veterans are bringing them back and then dro- going, what, going to the river and dropping them out of their pants? I mean it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So these are legitimate finds, and they're legitimate because the Welsh were here. Uh, early on, and we see this in the uh, in the ruins. And by the way, there is evidence of destruction of uh, of st- stone forts in America. If you look on page two, you can see one such uh, survey done by E. T. Cox in uh, the uh, mid mid late uh, eighteen in eighteen seventy four there, and afterwards they they quarried the site. And used the stone to build the Big Four Bridge in Louisville for a railroad, and then sent an archaeologist in the 1890s who claimed he didn't know anything about geology. He claimed that it must be natural, and that he never saw he never saw any uh, evidence of mm-hmm. uh, human activity. But E.T. Cox and his crew they were geologists, and they said this is a legitimate uh, human fortification. Now uh, Rick Osman, who wrote uh, the Graves of the Golden Bear, the Golden Bear referring to Arthur, okay. uh, has a theory that that this was underdone by the American government in order to hide the evidence of the Welsh having been here. And I'll step through uh, some evidence for that that uh, conspiracy theory at the end of this this little discussion. Yeah. So on page twelve, here is an example of Chong Dynasty like scripts showing up. And and Minifee County in Kentucky, 15 MF 355. Okay. Sure. Now they'll call the, on the right there, the figure 11. They'll call that a, a vulva. It's not a vulva. It's very obviously the three rays of the Alwyn turned upside down. Okay, but mm-hmm. it's the Colburn name of God. Yeah. And then uh, the question is, can we translate what's in over here on figure 10? I I regret to say that probably uh, 15 MF 355 is probably a destroyed site. So if it weren't for Lee and the Ancient Kentucky Historical Association, in fact, that Spratt site that I mentioned, 15, 15 MF 355, um, definitely was destroyed, the, the ruins part. Uh, I have personally visited the Welsh um, uh, mounds. There are mounds there that are not conical mounds, like as in the Hopewell, but they are Welsh mounds like you would find in, in, uh, in England and all that uh, in the U.K., and they are st- they are stone piles. They are fortunately undisturbed, and and so the serpent mound that is there that you saw the with the running script and the open mouth and all that in the last time we talked, that is still there, partially destroyed by logging roads. However, the ruins that are on the sill side have unfortunately almost certainly been destroyed, almost all of them. So the job of the Ancient Kentucky Historical Association going out there in the uh, 80s. Uh, the 70s, 80s, 90s, and uh, photographing these is really important, and uh, we'll probably not get you know any notoriety. Uh, they provided a survey to the University of Kentucky, and they still didn't protect the site. Now, what what kind of symbols do we see? We see a bowl motif. Well, we know that uh, from the uh, uh, Venus Smith. We see mm-hmm. the the hands uplifted to the sky. We see the cosmic uh, pole with the uh, sphere on top of the oblate sphere. Uh, mm-hmm. We see the ram's head or uh, bull horns, if you if you will, mm-hmm. and the cross motif. Yes, I see that. Yeah, yeah. We see all of this kind of stuff. So uh, I list those out, uh, you know, in uh, things one through ten, and then going on again uh, at the next page, uh, we see what the archaeologists call nutting holes. Well, what does it look like to uh, to you? I mean, to me, it looks like a serpent head. Uh, just like we've discussed before, uh, which is a comet tail following a series of spirals, which is, right. as uh, Wall and, uh, and Talbot have explained, is due to the, the rotating of the Earth and the movement and the, and, you know, 
of things, the circular nature, gives it that undulating. Mm -hmm. And they have and they have specified it. Uh, I'm not saying it can't be constellations, but the idea that they are holes for putting in nuts and then grinding them, uh, that there's no pattern to it, is, is uh, completely laughable. <laughs> and bear in mind that not a single uh, so-called certified archaeologist has ever came out to that site and, uh, and truly analyzed the site. And you can see in figure 14, there are very clear indications of Paradian Z-pinching and uh, the upside down script now so is it welsh people that carved these or was the site anciently occupied later the welsh came and visited it for whatever reason maybe they were brought there but they can be translated according to the language of the one religion that was around the world at, at that time yes. um stepping through uh we can look at the symbol for oneself in chinese uh, gu, and uh, how sim uh, similar it is to the Ren symbol. And what does it look like? It looks like the T rune. Remember that the thunderbolt and the god are the same. The Lord is his power. Mm -hmm. I was listening to the Iliads today with the children, and it was talking about uh, his, his, uh, his shaft, his, his arrow, uh, his scepter. And it was all referring to Zeus, the entire well in this translation, Jupiter. Um, they were very specifically referring to the 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 God, the Lord, as his power, that as it would descend down and and provide destruction. This is in the first chapter of the Iliad. If people mm -hmm. get a chance, go listen to it. It's it can't be missed because there's a plague and the Greeks I uh, think that they have been uh, – that that their enemy has prayed to Zeus, and that is why the plagues and destruction are happening, mm -hmm. is that uh, he's answering them. And then so they're, they're in all sorts of bad ways, right, because they've been over in Troy. Well, why have they been over in Troy for 10 years? Because their lands were destroyed, so they took to the sea to go get – it had nothing to do with the princess. That's, that, that's just romanticism. Uh, the reality is that they had become sea peoples, and they needed a new home. And yeah. Troy looked like as good a place as any. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can see also in that uh, you can see other kinds of uh, motifs. You got the cross motif. You got the bullhead motif over there on L23675. Um, you've also got sometimes two, uh, two little uh, tea runes. That's probably Saturn and Jupiter, because some in some cultures they were considered brothers. Okay. okay. Now in in uh, page fifteen here we talk about we see the subject of uh, God in Colbrin, and I I think this is worth reading out loud uh, to people. So okay. this is this is from a really great book on ancient Welsh grammar that I found. This is not a Wilson Blackett book. Um, it's a book put out by John Williams, 1856, and the original author uh, from the book uh, was 1530 to 1606. So anybody saying that YOLO created the script in the 1800s can't be right because the original works were coming from the 1500s and even back to the, to the 600s. Okay, so the, this is the code of the vocal song. First of all, it must read the letters. Uh, the British alphabet is said to be of divine origin. God, in the beginning, announced his name and said you know, these three lines that we're talking about, which became the tea rune. Mm -hmm. Whereupon uh, all things sprang simultaneously into life and being and responded to a shout of ecstatic joy. And at the same time, there spread three rays of light, forming the divine name, the first three letters, which were also the source of all letters and sciences. Uh, I'll just say Ein again. Uh, mm -hmm. Who was favored with this site took three rods of mountain rods. We see that in the Bible too. Rods of mountain ash and ins inscribed upon them the name of the deity, the deity. But the people that took saw them took mistook the rods, thus bearing his name for God Himself, which caused uh, again Ein again uh, to die of grief. That sounds a lot like what Moses went through. Hmm. Okay. Now, so what are we what are we hearing here? These runes were cosmic symbols yes. in the sky and yes. the people were misunderstanding 
the the sound and the light uh, um, and the symbols for the actual name. But the origin and reason of all this is discovered to us in the Bardic traditions. There we learn that God created the world by the melodious threefold utterance of his holy name, and that the four the form or figure of that name was that symbol. Being the rays of the sun, of course, this is not correct, right? But that's all this guy could know. At the equinoxes, solstice is converging to focus the eye of the light. Show God in his various characters as the creator, preserver, and destroyer. The divine name may not be uttered because no mortal man can articulate the harmony of the sound. It is kept a secret lest by the ignorant and be abused and dishonored. Uh, by the Hindus, uh, this is you know the opinion of that uh, that author at that time. Formation of the additional letters found uh, uh, are the single one, the triple, and then the upside down version, which is almost like a W, or Yao, Yao. So there you go, Yao, Yahoo, Yahweh, and uh, the uh, well the Cherokee is Wahoo, and the Yao is in the Chinese. So again, did the Chinese know? explication for until I gave the presentation that symbol you can see that I highlighted with green is almost exactly what you see coming out of the Chinese for the etymology of D the Lord mm -hmm. okay, and again you see it there on figure 8 on the bottom of 17 if you compare figure 8 with what you're seeing here the only thing you have to add is a pyramid at mm -hmm. the top yeah and then Square at the bottom. By the way, the square in Chinese is a mouth. And what else do we see? We also see a semicircle, which could be the boat or shell motif. But I'd say it's the boat motif. Yeah. Time. Now look at the, some of the etymologies in the, sig the center of figure 20. What do you see? It's the alpha fish. Okay. Now that, yeah. alpha fish, that alpha fish is the symbol for weapon. Uh, the alpha and the omega. I am the Alpha and Omega. How am I the Alpha and Omega? Because the Thunderbolt is the Alpha and the Omega. The electricity is the Alpha and the Omega. Okay? I see, yeah. It's amazing stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it's cool. See, we see here, I go into some uh, detail talking about uh, the power of the, the Yao on um, uh, page 19. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but you do see, to shake, you see the motif, you see the, the uh, symbol for sun. You see the symbol for the, the mankind or the God, the, the Lord up on the top there. You see also the the uh, oblate sphere inside of the square, the square. So you have the circle and, and square motif. And then over here for anger, you if you see there at L2712, you see the dot with the center, which is definitely the sun, and then upraised arms and two crosses. Or, or on the left there are two fireballs coming down with crosses. These yes. are symbols and power, but it, with upraised arms, look like anger coming down. Yes. And wrath. I mean, it's it's incredibly frightening to to imagine what that would would have looked uh, looked like. Yes, uh, I, and I, I like your reinterpretation of that uh, serpent with the egg. It definitely looks like a comet to me. Absolutely. 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 There's no, yeah. no doubt about it. Yeah. Um. Now, coming down, uh, let's see here. I, 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 we don't need to go through all of these. I mean, you can see some of them are just fantastic. I mean, uh, looking at, uh, you know, the word for rain, you can definitely see the deluge happening. I mean, who wants to drive that many dots? You know, it's, it's very obvious that there's, uh, that they don't mean a little bit of rain. They mean a lot of rain. Mm -hmm. um, there's the eye motif shows up in uh, some of these um uh, the boat motif, uh, the the cross, uh, the Maltese cross mm -hmm. uh, motif for the sun. Uh, we get back to uh, you know twenty one, the Venus again showing up here with the the bull of heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, the bull of heaven uh, looks a bit like a comet flying. Uh, it's almost unmissable. It's and kind of taking out a penis to look too. And my, and my, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. And my, my favorites in 20, page 22, uh, we see here two oblate spheroids and they're in motion and then they're above each other. And then there's even a shaft of energy going from one to the other. 
and the transfer. And then we see references to, to uh, what appear to be uh, genitalia. Yeah. Right? And then more, com- more comments by the Lu Shu Tong. More, more flying uh, asteroids and such. Right? So, yes. I mean, it, it's, it's becoming very clear, I think, to anybody that's paying attention. By the way, on page uh, 23 there, you've got the Venus of Willendorf uh, in, in the Chinese glyphs, L29782. Mm-hmm. Interesting stuff. Also, oh, please yeah. note that the backwards and forwards upside down J's are notable in the runes that were found uh, at the Spratt site here in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, now, yes. uh, um, let's move on down to, uh, we'll skip all the, the, the explication. Okay, now, back to, to the, the Colbrin on page 25. All right, now, uh, something that people need to know, there are more runes than the, the uh, images that I had shown before. And uh, these runes, they're from different periods of time. Uh, one of the most important ones is this Tehran. Um, this is an interesting um, rune, this TH rune. It's obviously related to what we were just discussing is the symbol for the three rays of the Lord coming down. But it's also a consonant that, that shows up in several languages. Uh, the Ta sound for thunder and um, uh, obviously Thor and Odin, um, and of course the word thunder even still, uh, showing up over and over again. Mm-hmm. And, and so Tehran uh, is no different here. Uh, Tehran meaning um, uh, undoubtedly a thunder god. Uh, so that, that's uh, really fascinating, this T sound. There yes. is something about that that is, that is uh, repeatedly showing up. Uh, and then when we get into uh, translations, uh, they translated the, um, the Sprat site inscriptions. Uh, we do see references to the below and under and to uh, the place of reverence and, and a ruler and the God and the power and the end and his manifest outward. Uh, now, I can't say for sure that this is a correct translation. I am just saying here you have some of the same concepts that are in the Ramses the Second Slay. A state of going down, below under, a god, a two, uh, like the you know, the number two, a power, and a manifestation. All right, these are central themes in the Ramses the Second Slay, which has if the if the listener uh, remembers from the previous videos, uh, the Ramsey Soleil has measurements of diameter, uh, uh, polar and equatorial diameter ratios to Jupiter and Saturn within 1% of satellite measurement. So the story on the Ramsey II Soleil, and maybe we covered that in another video, the solar, the solar orb uh, paper, it's, in a, it's another paper, um, it's the same information as they're translating with Colbrin, the plasma scripts that were carved undoubtedly by natives. And why do we know it was natives? Because the, the Welsh did not arrive in America till after King Arthur II brought them here because of the comet in, in, uh, the, in 535. But the events that we're talking about were happening during the Exodus uh, and previous. So these scripts were carved previous to that. Right? Okay. Yes. They, had to. They, yeah. have, they may have um, updated them or added to them. We don't know. But what we do know is that they would have identified with them and had a similar belief. Could they have themselves been the people who came over here if they were the Arthurian uh, kings who had knowledge? They may have had previous knowledge of the American continent and been the people who started the Hopewell. Uh, and, uh, and, and maybe that's why when they came over, they were able to mingle with the, the uh, Hopewell and form the Fort Ancient. But whoever it was, that originally was in 
the land, these Alegui, they they date antecedent to the Arthurians arriving in Kentucky and Ohio, uh, in the Ohio River Valley. And we know that they came here because in the Welsh stories, on the stones in Wales, and this is in McCann's book, they, they make references to otters, bison, Native Americans with headdresses, um, the bravery and, the, and the, uh, the, the type of leather skins that they wore, all that stuff, the Great River, the mounds, they make references to all that stuff that belongs to the Alegui people that we call the Abina and Hopa. But the dating is most definitely previous to their arriving here as we define it as the fusionists. So the story that we're translating, we're able to translate because of the plasma scripts, because it's a universal language. And this proves that the Colburn is, is, uh, is legitimate because also the Chinese is legitimate. And we know the Chinese is not under attack. It's not under doubt. There's no doubt as to what the Chinese uh, stuff is, is meaning, only what its origins are, right? which recalls us of the Babylonian tradition of the one language that became separated and became many. Now, on page um, 27, we have the names, uh, and that's from the – which book did this come from? I think this came from the, uh, the same um, uh, ancient Welsh grammar book uh, in the orthography section. Uh, so we have the names of these runes. So on the left are the shapes, and on the uh, – uh, uh, you can see the modern uh, Welsh, how you would say it, and then on the right, the English name. So we're interested in the English uh, primarily, and then over here. Now, we don't go through all of them. We only pick the ones that are of the most interest to us. Okay, and then there's some more also on the uh, on the following page on 26. And okay. then I include their diagrams um, you know, from the book. Uh, we see the uh, LL symbol again. Um, we see the Y, et cetera. Uh, and we also see on page uh, 31 examples of the Welsh, uh, the Colburn script in Taliesin's history from 490 AD. So this is a thousand years previous to Yolo Morgan. Okay. So there's, there's no way that Yolo is up. All right. Uh, we, this is ancient poetry that has existed for more than a thousand years, people, going right back to the Arthurian age. Uh, so the bards kept it alive all that time. So I pick out of here specific runes, and we see this is the crescendo here of the point. So we have light or lober as L, and then open regions, uh, EL is the X, and you can read the rest here. Mm -hmm. uh, weapon and separating and a plague and gold and the Lord obviously. And there's probably more that are pertinent, and if anybody wants to do detailed analysis, feel free. So now you go back to the Chinese, and you look and you find out, do you see concordance with them? And uh, not to spoil it, but uh, yes, <laughs> is the yeah. answer. Um, let's take, uh, let's go to, um, let's look at here, page uh, 33, uh, and talking about uh, the the spirit, Shen. Um, Shen also uh, means, of course, the, the, the god. Um, and, and it means uh, the symbol kind of looks like the word for middle, uh, center, uh, but it's, it's actually the sun with a big line through it. What are the uh, symbols that we see over here on the etymology for the Chinese? Well, we see the cross and the moving star, like a moving star. We see a man praying. We see two oblate spheres that are connected with the center motif. Uh, we see the yin-yang and its origin with a clear uh, stream of energy probably being transferred from one to another. Uh, there in L04, was it 528? Yeah. Uh, we see a couple of thunderbolts. We see also a separation line with with something in between and something on the right and something on the left. Also looks like an and, S. Uh, yeah, we have the S uh, showing up. Um, but the point is the, the, the right versus the left. And these are some of the runes that we, that we uh, saw often in uh, some of the, uh, uh, the Welsh 
we saw the right and the left. As in a comp, uh, the this is getting back to the to the discussion of the separating. So there's a there's the concept of pulling things apart. Mm -hmm. okay. We also see in the a the ARF or AE. Um, it looks like a sideways A, uh, referring possibly to an alpha or to God. Uh, but when you turn that uh, that sideways, it looks like the weapon. It looks like the weapon. And remember that the word "gu" in Chinese means uh, oneself, but it's also a halberd. Uh, and so if you look there on figure 43, um, on page 32, the weapon is showing the symbols for the Tehran, the T. Yeah. And it's showing the downward symbol of the Lord, the, the, Yao, the Yao shape. And so now the alpha and the weapon, uh, the G is oneself, uh, which we also see over there, L08528, sideways V. That symbol shows up in the Colburn as well. It also looks like karate movements. It does look a little bit like karate movements. Yes. I, I, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, so like the, that one, that one. the separation, these are symbols that were coming from the sky. Yep. And when we look at gold uh, going down to uh, 35, or because remember gold was one of our, in, uh, our uh, interesting ones, uh, we see uh, similar words um, and symbols in the Colbrin with the Chinese, but you do not see it with the Futhark and Ogham. Uh, sometimes occasionally with the Futhark, but not, not really, because yeah. it's newer, whereas yeah. the Colbrin is ancient. And you can use the Colbrin to decipher Hebrew and Etruscan. That's amazing. Because the Colbrin is from that area. And originally, it and the, and the Shang may have come from the same place, uh, from around Babylon. But it would have been a long, long time antecedent to the events uh, of, the, of the Welsh forming uh, the kingdoms of Glamorgan and Gwent, and certainly well antecedent before they came to uh, North America and carved uh, upon runes and, and merged with the Hopewell people uh, to form the Fort Ancient culture. Uh, and obviously the Shang would have been far sundered uh, from them in becoming uh, after the Shang dynasty. We don't even know what happened to the Shang. Maybe they became the Olmec in South America, or maybe they just uh, were killed out, or maybe they were made into slaves and became part of the Zhou dynasty, which is most likely the, the case. Um, but we see the same symbols uh, we see the sideways, uh, the sideways V uh, symbol there, and uh, we see the same uh, the Yao, the Yao shape uh, or Yao, if people would prefer uh, going down. Um, we see the Jacob's ladder, and all these same symbols are showing up in both places in discussing the same words. And uh, you know, I won't go through every single one of the the glyphs. People can certainly read the paper. Yeah. So as far as I'm concerned, this is uh, basically uh, exact proof that the Colbrin is a plasma script and that the, therefore the, the Colbrin can be used to read the Welsh stones and the Welsh stones therefore tell true stories about King Arthur. That now, is incredible. Going, going on to, uh, you know, just covering the, um, what happened here in Kentucky and in, in the appendices, I have some of the, the scans from uh, different books and places uh, about uh, possible places where they come into Kentucky. And then also some other stones. Uh, you can see the Chi a much less known stone called the Chi Ro stone. I don't even know where it is. It may be lost forever. We see symbols of a sun exploding. We see symbols of, uh, that may be referring to Christ. Uh, the you know, fish. It's, it's um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, other signs that you know, pre-Columbian Christians were here. Yeah. Uh, on uh, plate five, there on thirteen. Uh, this is again out of Wilson and Blackett. We see the the swastika symbol again, symbolizing a great wind, and we know it's wind because uh, the Chinese. Um, have also uh, uh, included that X symbol in the word for wind. I'm not and seeing I, the swastika. 
Uh, it's uh, right there on the third the third line, plate five, uh, page forty three. I'm sorry, fourth line. You can see the uh, the, the swastika oh, there. Okay. Well, yeah, okay, yeah. It's pure winds, pure winds. Uh, so referring to the blowing of the 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 winds, possibly. Uh, in destructions, but it could have been the original pure. When you say pure winds, maybe that's a, re a reference to uh, up in the sky. Mm -hmm. So uh, up and up on the the actual the plasma flowing, uh, you know, to do with the center. Maybe Mars, maybe Venus. We don't we don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I I contend probably when it was Mars. But uh, you can see that it is part of the character for wind in Chinese feng. Uh, I want a brief. I want a synopsis of your conclusions too. Of like in a not. You don't have to give dates, but what exactly? Uh, took so I'm going to go through King my Arthur. theory uh, here. Yeah. Here transitioning into the Kentucky stuff. Yeah. Uh, you can see on uh, 44 where um, the the Kentucky inscription sites tend to be found, okay. and then when you go down. Um, and you look on my my map of the native sites of Eastern culture, mm -hmm. in plate seven, the gray sites tend to be in the same areas, all above the falls of the Ohio, mm -hmm. where the Cherokee maintained they slaughtered the mound people at the falls of the Ohio. Why would they do and, that? Well, and we're going to go through that. Uh, if you take a look at this map, there's a couple things to notice. Number one, the Mississippians uh, tend to stay south of the gray and west. And uh, they tend to stay off of the archaic mounds. And we talked about those archaic mounds. But we talked about them in terms of black earth. Mm -hmm. um, but those ancient people would have been gone a long time. Mm -hmm. So why did they stay off of them? They were respectful. Yeah. And then uh, the Adena Hopewell and Fort Ancient all to the east. And then also spread around. But the concentration of their culture to the east. Now look at the separation between them. Uh, that's what, uh, my friend, that's what you call a... Uh, separation of, of, of two states yeah. all right so we have a, a contest of powers the when the welsh came here after the comet the electrical comet of 535 mm -hmm. that destroyed the the fields of glamorgan and logris and then went down and struck in peru um the uh when they came here they established forts out of stone such as the so-called Indian Fort in Berea and the stone fort I mentioned there at Charlestown State Park um, that was dismantled to make that big fort bridge, which, by the way, they still don't want you going up on that hill. Uh, if you go to Charlestown State Park, uh, they don't want you going up there, and they now they say it's owned by somebody else and all this stuff. It's part of a state park, but they don't want you to go up on, a, on top of the hill because they don't want you looking for evidence of the uh, Welsh that were there. Yeah. Um, and all these different uh, stone sites. Uh, so all that, all of these uh, tend to be on this side because they had a control of the lanes, the ancient lanes going up to the Michigan Copper. And they also wanted to have control of the fluorospar mines that are between, because the, the Kentucky and Illinois have the largest fluorite mines in the uh, world, and floor spar is used in smelting of iron. Um, whereas the Mississippians were able to maintain control of the areas that had a lot of uh, uh, pearls, and uh, obviously they controlled the, the, the source of the river. Now, um, they appear to have been wiped out primarily by smallpox by, by the Chinese, but we don't know for sure. It could have been some other disease. I mean, if the Welsh were here, uh, we presume that the Welsh did not come up the Mississippi because they wouldn't have been able to get very far, but it came down the St. Lawrence and uh, came because that's the way the Welsh, the Welsh stones seem to uh, indicate is they came from Nova, Sco Nova Scotia and down the St. Lawrence and then came down through Pittsburgh and all that and then and established, uh, you know, uh, relations with the Hopewell here. But then they, they they were wiped out. King Arthur was killed here, according yeah, to how did that happen? Yeah, basically they snuck up behind him and killed him. It wasn't it was super super easy, barely an inconvenience. I mean, they just snuck up behind him and killed him. And then his body was shipped back in a sack, 
and his mummified remains were left in a cave in Wales until his son was old enough to take power, and then he was buried under a church, and Wilson and Blackett bought that church thinking they would get the permission to dig up the body, and they did not. They, they were denied that, and they are sold. They're ready to, to perish. I mean, they're very old. They're over 90 <clears throat> years old. And uh, like true bards, they've had long lives of study. They put everything on the line, their mortgages, their careers, blah, 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 for the secret, for the knowledge, Yeah, uh, which is what the true bards have always done. Mm -hmm. um, and they're immediately so I, cast as outlaws. You know? Basically, uh, when they put out that Rex Artur, Ar Artorius Rex book, that was pretty much the end. Yeah. Um, and yet it was the beginning for all of the rest of us. And unfortunately oh, for yeah. them, they came at the end of the age of, of, of just books, and uh, they published so much of this stuff without putting it onto the internet. That's why it's important for people like us to go forward and actually uh, can translate the stuff and put it on the internet. Isn't this picture interesting? This is the spot which Alan Wilson claims King Arthur is buried, and his cross was found here. But don't the remains of the church look like the figure of a man laying down that's it's pretty ironic isn't it it's almost like it's saying he is here uh 20 kilometers from the giant thunderbolt strike site uh and yet he was correct there was a longborough mound there so these the, the, this religion there it's not diffusion versus yeah. uh electric universe the electric universe explains both the travel of diffusion and the similarities, you know, yes, there weren't uh, ancient Jews making the menorah mound in uh, the Midwest of North America, but it wasn't like they were completely different people. They had the same belief in an above Lord and the same belief in his power and the rays of energy coming off, right? Mm -hmm. And the, whatever that symbolized in the ancient days that later on became, of course, the the menorah uh um, and and whatever it meant to the natives here but it, it meant something they would have been able and i don't know if they'd been able to speak together but they would have been able to worship together uh most assuredly uh so i i maintain that they came here um then they then they had trouble they were wiped out uh that first time then they came back again, one of the lost Roman legions. They came back. They established an even stronger fortress because they knew all about this region. They intermingled with the Hopewell because the Hopewell would have been weaker by then. Uh, and disease and warfare with the Mississippians, who probably, where did the Mississippians probably come from? Most probably Mexico. What right? happened I mean, to the were Anastasians? Was it the Anastasi? Do you know? Uh, no, I do not know. I don't, I don't tend to study any of the Southwestern, uh, natives as much. Um, uh, it is a big weakness of mine. I do, I do tend to focus in this area, okay. uh, because it has so many connections to our culture via the Arthurian myth and, and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, so they established this alliance. They formed the Florida ancient culture. They're building real forts. Why would they need to build forts? Because they were under attack. They had fear. Why did they have fear? Because they were doing commerce. They were doing things that were unsacred and unholy. They were using wheels and had writing, and they were living near mound sites or on mound sites uh, and establishing their own fortifications. And how do we know this? Because it, getting back to the conspiracy of the government to hide things on the federal base in Madison County, Kentucky, there is a giant mound site which has uh, – Mounds uh, conforming to Lyra and, and uh, more importantly, Cygnus forming a Christian cross, a giant Christian cross with, as you can expect, the Tehran or Yao symbol, a uh, hundred foot uh, uh, earthwork next to it, stamped almost to say, yes, we were here and this was our religion. And it's a giant cross and they date that site to the 1100s most definitely pre-Columbian, and they had agriculture. And this is in the area that we see very nearby uh, connections to the runic sites and connections to the serpent mounds and connections to the conical mounds, all in this area you see on plate seven in the orange and gray and blue area on the right. Mm -hmm. And then what happened to them? Most probably they got into a war. 
uh, probably the Cherokee did band together and come out of Tennessee and Georgia uh, and North Carolina and come up uh, and probably join powers with the Iroquoians and may have even brought uh, water powers up from uh, Mexico to support the Mississippians to, to fight. But then later on, it didn't matter. Uh, the Chinese came along and, and uh, smallpox, and uh, that's a different story. But in the uh, early 1500s, the smallpox came in and wiped out the Mississippians, anyways. And uh, the Cherokee were so wiped out, they, they were reduced to nobody occupying uh, Kentucky uh, anymore for hundreds of years. Uh, the, the stories of the blood and, and, uh, and the war here, uh, and in fact, the natives were quite surprised. That Daniel Boone's people um, wanted to live in Kentucky because of the ghosts, you know, and the giants and the mummies that were that were left behind from all these mm-hmm. wars uh, that were just a few hundred years uh, antecedent. Mm-hmm. Uh, we see here the king on the page forty-six, uh, the play date, the King Arthur the Second and Madoc uh, suspected sites in Kentucky, which includes fortifications and certain mounds, and uh, they do overlap. The strategic control of the Falls of the Ohio, which was a giant waterfall and shipping lane, <laughs> and of course this central bluegrass region. You know, um, that um, when you yeah, yeah, there's something that came into my mind that I have to remember to tell you. But sure. uh, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, I, no, I'll, no, wait. I, I'll wait. That's, that's pretty much it. I mean, I just show a little bit of the family tree on plate eight, uh, and I just have a little quote there. Um, and I'd like to end with the, the last quote. Arthur II died in 579. Simplified genealogy gives a chronological placement for Urien Regid uh, of the gift as Talison, the chief bard of Arthur II, moved the court of Urien Regid after Arthur II's funeral in 580. And detailed genealogies serve to tie in the numbers of 6th century personalities. That's from uh, the Wilson Black text. And I will say also that they have a fantastic amount of information uh, using the land of charters and using all of the uh, Christian information, that is, that's how we know that they're doing real legitimate work. They're looking at Christian records that come out of the Bibles, and they're finding names. And these guys all had family members who were royalty. So the royalty and the priests were wrapped up together. So you can follow the 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 bloodlines of the priests. And you get the bloodlines of the of the royal families going back to Arthur, which then goes back to the first Arthur, uh, who defeated the Romans uh, and Caesar, and then goes all, all the way back to uh, Brutus of Troy. And at the time that they were eliminating the Welsh's right to have a language and a culture, uh, they were saying that, it, that YOLO was a fake and a fraud, and then what happened? Within uh, within 20 years, they found Troy, and then they never came back and admitted that that, that they were wrong. And, and the gov- American government has definitely covered up sites here in Kentucky, and uh, for whatever reason, maybe Thomas Jefferson was afraid that the British would make war. Uh, but I don't see why that would need to be why they would need to hide it in the late 1800s. And in the 20th century, as far as I know, the Bluegrass Army uh, base with the chemical weapons on it is a 20th century base, why would they build over top of a site with a giant uh, Christian cross? Probably there are government documents talking about the likelihood of this. Mm-hmm. But for sure, they only allow one archaeologist site uh, access to the whole thing, and she focuses on pottery from the field where they do um, – the, where the ar- agriculture is shown. She doesn't care about mounds. She doesn't care about the cross. She doesn't care about the uh, – the Tehran symbol, the Yao, all right? We care about it because it shows the concordance of the way humans used to live and how we used to understand each other. Yeah, of course, true, Pastor. Along, we didn't get along, but that's because we learned from the gods' war. You know, 7,000 years ago, we learned that war was okay, you know, which is silly. I mean, we, yeah. we, it's very amazing. You're listening to the in the Iliad, right? You have these people, and they are uh, thinking that the pestilence is coming upon them because of things that they have the, the wars they've had with uh, uh, Nestor and, and Ceres and the Tro- Trojans and all this stuff, right? They think that that's why the, the gods are moving up in the sky. I mean, you know, mankind thought that we had this intimate relationship with these, these giant spheres. 
that they were like people. Mm-hmm. And it's been a huge fallacy that has caused us a huge number of problems. Oh, yeah. uh, we learned a lot of technology and we learned a lot of uh, uh, war. Of course, a lot of technology comes from our military yeah. uh, to this day. Including this, the internet. This actually, uh, it, it provides the missing information, actually. I watched a video by the New, uh, New Earth Channel of, of a year or so ago, and it starts with Chief Joseph surrendering to, uh, I think, a Spanish general, and he gives him a Somali tablet or a Sumerian tablet. And he's like, where did you get this? And he said... Uh, White men were here before you, and they treated us better. And uh, the the chief gave this to my father. And it turns out that, uh, according to the New Earth Channel and this video, they knew of a last vestige in the Pacific Northwest that had gone there because they were just tired of wars and being wiped out and, you know, all this. But she, according to that video, she didn't have any information of how they got there. And this is that information. Yeah, I mean, diffusion is a fact. Oh, it's absolutely. Just, there's no doubt that people diffused. Mm-hmm. But the timing is everything. You yes. you know, we can't use diffusion to explain everything. We You know, there's these people that want to run around and say the Vera coaches were everywhere. Graham yeah. Hancock is uh, the white The white man said, I mean, that's not what that story means. But but he's interpreting it that way. Why? Because he is descendant of the victim the pair of Victorians and the Victorians. And uh, so unfortunately, as, as good a person as Graham Hancock is, and, and he's married to uh, a, 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 a woman, she's a person of color, so he doesn't mean it this way, but he comes across bringing this idea that, uh, that, that these, these ancient Atlantean white people were going all over the world. That's not what that story is about. But at the same time, it's not like it's not true that there weren't diffusions and mm-hmm. that there weren't Atlanteans and that they weren't settling and that they, they, they weren't becoming Phoenicians and my ancient – my, my uh, ancestry, the, the Basque people and um, possibly Algonquians, uh, these different cultures moving about. I mean I, I have a theory that the Amazonians came from this area, from Kentucky, because of the dark earths, and so where were they – but we don't have any evidence in between. You know, because they left here uh, around the Exodus period and went in search of new lands, or they mm-hmm. or they were wiped out, one of the two, and then and then somehow there's people forming the same kind of mounds and and creating uh, tree crops in in the Amazon, but now after the age of uh, the birth of Christ. So what happened for those two thousand years in between? Well, it, it ostensibly it would take a while. To sail along and you know and intermingle and, and maybe your people are enslaved with the uh, with the Mayans etc. I mean who knows? Or maybe the secret was always here and it was passed along and there was a lot of trade routes. There may have been a triangle trade going from the mouth of the Amazon uh, to those inner cities of the Amazonians uh, up to the um, the copper mines mm-hmm. and all the way at the Great Lakes. And then all the way down over to the Yucatan and Mexico, uh, with first with the Mayans and then with the Aztecs. And this triangle trade may have been interrupted by these Welsh uh, interlopers who came in and, and seized the falls of the Ohio. And that may have angered uh, the, the uh, tri- and maybe a naval power came along. I can tell you when I went to the Toltec uh, uh, site in uh, Arkansas, which they discredit as Toltec now. Um, I most definitely – I looked at this. I was like, this is a naval power. I can tell this is a naval power. Uh, mm-hmm. But it might have yeah. been just boats, you know, like canoe boats. But at some point, there was an empire here. If you go to uh, the um, Old Stone Fort in Tennessee, and you can't tell me if you're standing in the middle of that, and you're surrounded on all sides by rivers with big mounds and cliffs around it. That this is not the site of an ancient fort power, but it wasn't the Spanish and it wasn't the Welsh because it's too large. It's too large for them to defend it. It had to be a big group. And then they say, well, we don't find any bodies here. Well, I'm like, well, yeah, because the site was industrialized and mm-hmm. colonial, people, uh, colonial people destroyed all sorts of native stuff. They dug up things. 
They were, you know, burying, they were burning uh, remains. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course you're not going to find signs of it, but it's too large to be defended. And there's no other ostensible use of these walls that go all the way around on the edge of a cliff uh, next to, between two rivers, yeah. right? This is most definitely a fort. So what are we looking for? We're looking for an empire that is uh, either of the same period or just after the period of Poverty Point. Because Poverty Point, its power was uh, – its commerce was centered um, probably halfway between the Mexican powers and the copper mines in Michigan because mm -hmm. we don't know where all that copper has gone, right? right. And so we don't. Wh why was it interrupted? Because it, the, all the dating in the site shows that it was interrupted in the time of the Exodus, 1500 B.C. to, to 1700 B.C., somewhere in there. Yeah. You know, See, I, last time I misspoke, I, I said that it seemed that mankind was more peaceful. What I really meant to say was it seemed like mankind was more uh, accepting of different races. Would that be a uh, fair statement? Yeah. I mean, everybody was racist, but it wasn't yeah. like it wasn't considered a wrong thing. You know, I mean, the thing is that uh, back in the day, you know, we get the, the feeling like the Irish got it real bad. Um, the, the Irish were just as uh, raci racist against the English mm -hmm. uh, and against the Scots uh, and against the Italians. When they came to America, the Irish were treat mistreated. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. But they were racist against the Italians. I mean, you know, and these are all different white people. That's the way it was. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you came from just a different part, in Greece, if you came from Athens or, or uh, Sparta, uh, the Greeks who came from Barbaros were barbarians. Right. You know, and to us, I, I met a I met a Chinese uh, where well, we had a Chinese teacher, and um, she was teaching us Mandarin, of course. And uh, I asked her where she's from, and she said this part, and I said, "Oh, where's that?" And Manchuria. Oh, Manchuria. And she said, "Oh, but I'm Han Chinese." She was so worried uh, mm -hmm. about uh, which kind of Chinese, you know, and of course Western. I'm like, oh, it's, it's all. It's like that everywhere. It's the same, you know. I mean, it's like, what are they, you know, what are they worried about? Because in most parts of the world. It still matters. Oh yeah. So and I know everyone the was does. everyone was racist, but it wasn't necessarily racist in a way like, like the, you know they wanted to get you know hang them or something. I mean in Africa, it's hard for us to imagine in Rwanda the, the amount of death between the 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 uh, Hutu and the Tutsis. But um, you know that's because to to us in the West they all look the, like they're all Africans, but but over there there's tremendous difference between them. And that's yeah. the whole the whole world was that way. Uh, yes, it was tremendous violence, but also at times uh, they could find ways to understand each other. And one way they understood each other was commerce. So if the Welsh came in there with their horses and their armor and they're making stone fortifications and they're practicing the ancient religion, but they're practicing it their weird way, right? And they're using wheels. Uh, I mean, that would be anathema yeah. Yeah. if you're a Mississippian. And you and 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 you understand the you know you're like oh well the Hopewells build conical mounds but these people, uh, they they do you know they make these stone graves and all these other kinds of things, uh, and you know we use platform mounds. I mean there's just a difference, and you can see it reflected in that map. I mean there's a tension that I can see from uh, different sides of the of of the uh, Ohio River Valley, and I have no doubt that the Cherokee myths are true. That and why they aren't taught in schools I don't know. Because I guess the racism of our uh, of our country, unfortunately, the native stuff is just not taught. Uh, and I can tell you from the Hidden Kentucky Project, the the waterfalls that are the most uh, polluted in Kentucky have the word Indian in them. You know, so mm. it's it's just an unfortunate thing where the the myths are being wiped out. But it also happened to other white cultures that weren't uh, our stream of culture. Uh, like I say, the Arthurian myths were stolen. And they were injected. Now you have like Disney, right? The Disney film uh, and the good old in, in London town. This didn't happen in London. There was no London. What are they talking about? <laughs> London, London was probably some uh, fort uh, cemetery at the time, some Roman fort cemetery. Yeah. You know, it, 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 London was nothing uh, compared to the Gold Morgan and Gwent at that time. Uh, so the King Arthur legends did not happen in England, and the the information was stolen. And then it was buried, and it was covered up, and then all uh, attempts to say that it's legitimate were poo-pooed by saying yeah. that Yola made it up, and and that there's no such thing as Troy, 
And it turns out both of those things are lies because uh, you have runes going back to ta- the, the, the histories of Taliesin, and you have uh, stones uh, dating well uh, previous to the 1000s, and you have uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know Yolos using a, a script which is definitely decipherable um, in multiple cultures. You know, and not saying that you would get an English uh, a phrase, turn a phrase out of it, but the symbols would mean something to ancient people from from the Hebrews, the Etruscans, the Chinese, and probably the Native Americans, mm-hmm. probably the, the, at least the people in this valley. Now, it, could it have been that the Welsh came over here and then they failed uh, two or three times? Yeah, it's possible, but I don't maintain that because uh, we only know from the Welsh stones that they came after uh, the 300s. Okay. Um, and probably 535, and then later on in the in the 1000s, and established a colony until they were wiped out. And why were they wiped out? Uh, and they were wiped out not by the way, not that long before the Chinese got here, right? And by the way, in, here's a question: in the to the gates of Feng Tu, uh, uh, the very opening sections, the Chinese sail to Mecca, and then uh, the the people at Mecca. Uh, tell them about America. Now, riddle mm-hmm. me this. How did the yeah. people at Mecca know about it, right? Yeah. That's the Chinese. It says it very specifically. This, is, this, is, this text has only been translated within the last few years. It's a Chinese text that goes yeah. back to the, to the 1400s. Uh, they, 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 have, they meet the Muslims. You can tell. There's no doubt. They talk very specifically, and because Islam doesn't change very uh, much at all, uh, you can tell that it is Mecca. There is no doubt about it that they are in Mecca. And the description of how they got there by going around Africa, everything is in there. Okay? Mm-hmm. And the Chinese are talking to them, and they agree. They don't want to, you know, one doesn't want to become Buddhist, and the other one doesn't want to become Muslim. But they like each other. They get along anyways. And then they ask them about, you know, well, we're ready to go home because we've reached the end of the world, and we've seen Europe and all this stuff. And he says, no, you, well, you know, you've got to go over to America. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm paraphrasing. And they're like, well, where's that? And they're like, go out the, 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 the way that you came in, yeah. uh, through the straits, then sail, uh, then another uh, one or two months, yeah. right? So they spend three months. It's in the book, yeah. in Chinese. And then they, uh, they first uh, uh, end up running into uh, the southern uh, Mississippians uh, cultures, and then uh, they go on up, and then they run straight up into the Cahokians. And they described yeah. Cahokia almost perfectly, and and there and thereby spread uh, and the, the they spread smallpox and then um, when they bring the story back to to the Ming emperor that you know that's when they they burn a lot of the records in order to uh, hide evidence because they were supposed to bring Buddhism around the world and said they brought pestilence that wiped I mean it was a it was a huge disaster yeah. uh, PR it was a PR disaster but how did the Chinese know they knew because the the people at Mecca and Medina knew. And how did they know? Because everybody knew. Only only our culture did not know. Columbus, it was not a super genius. He was buying maps off of people who knew. And those people knew because they got those maps from other people who got them from other people who had been here. Yeah. Now, it's just not yeah. feasible to, to, to have the expenses to go to America just any time. You have to have good reason. Arthur had a good reason. A comet came by, burned up Glamorgan and Gwent, so they came over. Yeah. You have to have good reason because there were people who lived here, and they and they they were they were killers. The whole world was killers, and and enslaving. Everybody was enslaving. Native Americans owned uh, slaves. Uh, African Americans owned slaves, and you could, people could look this up. I mean, everybody owned slaves. So it was just a violent world. It was a violent time, but diffusion is a fact. Everybody yeah. was going everywhere. Completely captivating talk, Ramon. I enjoyed oh, every great. minute of it. Yeah, the, oh, that I like, certainly. <laughs> what, what's that? It certainly got me animated. Oh no, that's that's great. I like that about you. Uh, you're you know you're into your work. I like this one uh, over here on the right. Uh, analysis and signs of Greco-Roman Nordic culture and the zodiac days. Related yeah, to yeah. That's a smaller paper that I did that uh, shows some of the plasma scripts. But I'm going to have to read that. I'm, I'm into that's, anything. That's not a bad one. It, I, I like my, I like the short ones a lot. I, I like the the one on the Ferris wheel too, and okay, um, I'll get uh, into you know that. all that kind of. Stuff. 
Yeah, I, I, I find all of this, the sumo paper is one of the shorter-ish ones. I mean, it's only in the 20s. The Origins of Religion? Oh, I'm going to have to check that out. That's, that's one of the, that, that one's one of the, the well, maybe that's we should do that. The origins of the, that's the origins of all my work, honestly, because uh, that and describing what is EPEMC, mm -hmm. um, which uh, to clarify for people, anybody, it's open source cosmology. Anybody, any of you all can do it. I don't own a copyright to EPMC. Okay, just uh, you know, if you if you believe in plasma electromagnetic cosmology, and if you like uh, extra stuff, you can think of the E as extra. It means extended, but and you can think of it as extra stuff. Uh, you like Atlantis. You you like um, uh, diffusion. You like King Arthur. Whatever. Uh, just show evidence and bring it all together, write good papers, cite all your work, you make even better looking Oxford style papers. I'm an engineer, so I don't believe in that. So, I, you know, I put a footnote and put the link right there. I don't really care for all this uh, uh, highfalutin and I put a name and it's all mysterious. Where am I going to get that source? And you got to go to the library. It's a, that's a nightmare. I gave you the link. Boom. You get right to it. That's, that's the whole point of the internet, in my opinion. What is but, uh, anybody Luther? can write, write the papers in any, any uh, style they want. And uh, so I explained that in one of the PMC papers, but the only origins is where I really laid out the timeline I saw, at least at the time that I had written that, um, which is before I had read a few things and, and done certainly uh, some of this research, this Arthurian research, and before I had found a Thunderbolt strike site and all this stuff. Um, but it's a, it's a great paper. Um, it's got a lot of symbols, a lot of diagrams and things like that. Um, I uh, also wrote a, another long paper. There's several uh, long papers in mind. The Atlantis one's pretty long. The um, plasma electromagnetic sky is medium long. Uh, but the magnetic universe theory, uh, that one is like the one that we just did, uh, the plasma glyph one. Uh, the magnetic universe theory, that's a really, really long one. It's all alt-stream alt discussions pretty much. I mean alt-stream discussions of electromagnetism. Um, and I'm refuting the idea – that you can eliminate electricity and just talk about magnetism, uh, just as I would refute the idea that you can just talk about electricity and eliminate magnetism. And I hear this from time to time. I always find it amazing to me because you can you can go buy two magnets, and you can tell that there's no electricity happening. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know that a lot of people haven't had uh, a proper education uh, in electromagnetism by mm -hmm. going to, to college, and then there are people going to say, well, you know, then you're just indoctrinated. I'm not indoctrinated, folks. It's just that yeah. I, I'm telling you that there are things about electromagnetism where you can dualize the one force into electricity or to magnetism. Uh, of course, for all of us, I say plasma electromagnetism to combine the idea to get – I say in the, the uh, magnetic universe uh, theory paper, I say that the, the, the PEM, the PEM, is the unified ether theory that everyone's looking for. Uh, well, we don't need to look anymore. We unified found it. Unified ether look. theory. Yeah, yeah, the unified ether theory. Oh, right? my, look Everybody's that. looking for a unified field, uh, and blah, blah, blah. We don't need to go looking for a new one. That's the problem with the science. They go keep looking for a new one, and then they have to invent dark stuff and all that. Uh, it's, like it's like they went right by the exit. Uh, yep. We have it. What we yep. don't do is understand it. That's the right. issue. We have uh, models but not knowledge. Oh, I know. I agree. You're right. Did you say what's Futhark? What, yeah, what is Futhark? Oh, that's just another runic system. That's a modern, it's a, a, a late uh, Middle Ages uh, runic system. It's not yeah. ancient. Yeah. Ancient, I guess, uh, to you know, a seven-year-old, but uh, not ancient to a, a historian or a bard. You know? <laughs> Colbrin is, is, uh, is ancient, right? It's going gotcha. all the way back to the cataclysms and the, the gods. Uh -huh. And that's, that's why the Welsh had a real legitimate uh, religion and story. And the Arthurian stuff, yes, it has the reflections of the symbology, the floating island and the crescent boat and the cosmic hill, because they were using it to rule their people. It has every place in the world that legitimately is old did. Mm -hmm. And by the way, in another paper I discuss, all those cultures with those great memories, they're all hyper-masculine cultures. Or you might say machismo. Every single one of them. And uh, can we blame that on the Mars-Venus uh, affair, or is it maybe going all the way back to Zeus himself? I don't know. But they do tend to be mountainous places. So these mountainous places do tend to be hyper-masculine places. And all of them have great cultural memory. 
of uh, the events that happened in, in the skies. Mm -hmm. uh, it's harder to, to oust people from the hills, you know? They, they just oh, yeah. keep, keep their religion alive. <laughs> yep, Same yep. thing here in Kentucky, the Appalachians, you know? There's some of the, you know, Christianity as it dies throughout uh, the country and becomes something else, something about uh, positivism and something about singing rock songs. Um, it stays most true to its evangelical uh, and puritanist roots in Appalachia. Uh, and that's because those kind of cultures, they just tend to, to remember things, but they also tend to be hyper-masculine cultures or what some people will call patriarchal, which is such a – become such an unfortunate term uh, to deride. Uh, but the, those cultures tend to survive for a reason. Um, they, yeah. they, have, they have advantages. There's advantages. Cultures of fear. Cultures. Now, you could say it, but they see it's such a – we put such a negative spin on it. Uh, you know, I, I like it. I explain it to people as the difference between lions and tigers. Tigers are uh, perfectly egalitarian, and therefore the females uh, are single mothers that raise the single cubs, and it's very difficult for them to survive. Whereas lions are uh, patriarchal and uh, one male lion sitting on a copy, and they, they breed at fantastic rates. Yep. But they live in a much more dangerous uh, uh, realm, a lot more super predators around them. So the females benefit from the, the presence of uh, the male lion. And by the way, those male lions die probably the most violent deaths outside of the insect oh, the, world. Oh, the I mean, it's, uh, it's brutal. Horrible. I mean, yeah. every single one of them, unless, if, they, if they're fortunate, they die of disease. You know, yeah. uh, none yeah. of them die of old age, not a single yeah. one. No doubt. So, I know I've seen many, many things on lions. I've been into them for a long time. Yeah. It's just a brutal the, the world. Lions, yes, it is. And the, but the female lions derive protection. Uh, and help in raising the young. I mean, the, yep. the males help in raising the young. That's not true with tigers. I mean, now you know, you're starting to see prides being run by two and three males. Yeah, well, they have to. It's, yeah. an, it's an arms race because yeah. you, I've seen a video with uh, a three uh, a three male super pride mm -hmm. uh, with a father and two sons get totally destroyed by five males. Yep. Yeah, I like, saw that. Yeah. I saw that one. And and, and that's that's an arms race. And because they were they're all brain, hunted so. down one at a time. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but, you know, it's yeah. brutal the way they die. But my point is that the, the you know people misunderstand uh, these cultures, uh, and that's because they don't understand the origins of these things going back to survival of the cataclysms. Yep. And um, that's where you know hypermasculinity uh, becomes useful. Now, I think going too far uh, is is not good. Right. Obviously, but right. there are, there's a reason why these cultures survive. The Japanese, the Greeks, the uh, the Mexicans, the Scandinavians. Uh, I mean, the 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 Vikings were notoriously hypermasculine. Uh, yeah. I mean, you, you could actually you could uh, you could get in a duel if you if you said a man was girly. You know, yeah, in, yeah, hypermasculine. I like that. Very hypermasculine. So that's a great that's a great little paper uh, that I that I put out. But. Um, uh, it's been it's been my pleasure. I hope people go and uh, review some of the papers, especially the Chinese ones. The sumo paper is uh, uh, people love that paper. It's 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 a lot of fun. You know, right. I mean, a lot of people find find it is a funny little sport uh, with you yeah. know big fat people, but it makes complete sense uh, using the the uh, plasma electromagnetic cosmology. I gotta check it out. I'm gonna have to read that. Uh, it's just been uh, man, it's been captivating and inspiring, Ramon. I appreciate it. It's been a Pleasure, buddy. I'll talk to you if soon. You need huh? a, if you need uh, uh, help on that, by the way, you can go to akha.us or ancient Kentucky e with an e at the end instead of a y dot com. Okay. There's a book section, and uh, the books are listed on the left. And uh, those PayPal links go to uh, George um, because if you go on the Amazon, you're probably going to see people trying to sell you copies yeah. for hundred dollars. Well, that's that's good advice. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, those are those are scams. All right, Ramon. Until next right. time, buddy. Okay. Have a good time. Thanks Have again. a good night. All right, Bye. you too. Bye-bye. To me, this isn't anything about who was first or race or anything like it's more about another example of our true history being hidden from us. It's pretty apparent in the first century AD there was some kind of worldwide trade going on and cultures migrating because of world catastrophes. They do it even in war or any time. Now we call them refugees.